Hello and welcome back to this Down Fully Dualistic Crusade. This video is a review of the Olive Films Blu-ray release of the 1951 noir gem Cry Danger, which stars Dick Powell and Rhonda Fleming and was directed by Robert Parrish, which, and it's actually his directorial debut. And interestingly, after being an actor for a number of years and then moving into other aspects of the film industry, it was actually Dick Powell stepping in and getting this film made. Uh, it really is a sort of favor to help get Parrish his first major directorial credit that uh, we've have this film. And this is actually quite similar in spirit to some other noirs. Uh, that's why I have them on display behind me, uh, because it shares the same screenwriter and snappy dialogue as what you have in Tight Spot, and also it has a lot of similarities to the next film Parish would direct, which is The Mob. And both of these are found on the lovely Indicator Blu-ray releases as part of their Columbia Noir Volume 2 set. The plot of Cry Danger is seemingly simple, but it's how it is handled and the overall atmosphere that's generated by using and utilizing quite a lot of Los Angeles at the time with quite a bit of location shooting that gives the film a, a real time capsule period sense of Los Angeles, a sense of the city, a sense of the location. And also, you've got a rather unique uh, setting for most of the film, which takes place in a small uh, trailer park area in Los Angeles. So it's a particular side of L.A. at that time you really didn't see depicted in films. And all of this is accentuated and helped along by the fact that it's mostly done by location shooting. And so that's one of the benefits of digging into the lesser discussed or noirs that are more on the obscure side, particularly ones that feature great amounts of location shooting because you get that period flavor of a time capsule because you get that full you are there sense and you see all kinds of odds and ends and bits that could never be fully recreated on a soundstage at the time. So you really get that time capsule flavor. Dick Powell plays Rocky, who has just been recently released from prison after being falsely accused for a robbery. Uh, this is I'll come about because a former Marine has stepped up and and uh, provided him with an alibi five years after the fact. This Marine is wonderfully played by Richard Erdman, who, of course, uh, is not actually giving an alibi. He's merely doing this because he thinks that the robbery did actually happen and that Dick Powell's Rocky character will then uh, be grateful for getting him out of prison and perhaps kick him with a share of this supposed loot. It's, of course, uh, much to his chagrin to find out that uh, Rocky is himself innocent and all he really wants to do now that he's gotten out is clear him and his partner's name, who is still in prison. And, of course, look up his partner's wife, who, of course, is played by the lovely Rhonda Fleming. And, of course, she has long carried a torch for Rocky. If you've seen Dick Powell in any noir, you will, of course, know the incredible style and, and, and grit he could have on display. But, of course, this is really one of the biggest night and day ships in an actor's star persona that ever existed in classic Hollywood. If you know Dick Powell from before the noir era, uh, you know him for his musicals and you know him for being the juvenile leading man with the large grin and, of course, doing lots of singing. So... To have him suddenly appear in one of the best adaptations of Chandler that has been done, which is, of course, Murder, My Sweet, which was adapting Chandler's second novel, Farewell, My Lovely, uh, that was a real watershed moment. That was one of those films you see a star uh, completely do something they, that nobody thought they could do. And that film really reinvented Dick Powell in terms of his screen image. And he's so strong there and in all of his other noir titles and then his moving into the early days of television and continuing along those much more dramatic and gritty lines that makes you forget the uh, younger uh, Dick Powell in terms of all the musicals and things. So there's that real uh, distinction between the two. And here he's just just as wonderful as he was in Murder, My Sweet. What's also interesting here, and the real secret of this film and why it's a hidden gem, is that there is, in spite of the dour, gritty surroundings and the fact that this is a noir and there are rather dark moments, there's a sense of levity, there's a sense of humor, and it's a very sardonic, witty, 
humor. It's never on the nose, but this is right there in all of the dialogue. This has some of the snappiest dialogue you'll ever come across in a noir title, and that really goes back to the fact that it was written by William Bowers, who has this in a lot of his uh, screenplays around this time period. That's why I, I bring up Tight Spot, because he wrote that as well and brings that same energy and a levity that doesn't really feel like what you would expect from a noir title. And so the first time you see some of these films, uh, Tight Spot in particular has almost more of a screwball flavor, but then there's a particular turn that takes it right into full-blown noir territory. So you realize it was really just kind of a setup for that moment. Uh, well, here in Cry Danger, the humor is perfectly blended in to every noir element. So it doesn't overwhelm the, the fact that this is still a noir, this is still a crime story, this is still a man trying to prove his innocence five years later and track down leads that no one particularly wants him to track down and incurring the wrath of the criminal element. But it's also hysterical. It is hysterically funny. There are moments in this film that are so genuinely witty and surprising the first time you see this that you will actually be laughing and cackling out loud or biting your lip or something because it, they're, they're, the, the moments are so well done. Sometimes they'll almost pass you by and it takes a second for you to realize, holy crap, that was hysterical. You have to think back for a second. And so this is one of those real noir titles that is definitely made for repeat viewings. Uh, it, it is ridiculously enjoyable. And it's it's a particular levity and and sardonic wit that you just don't quite expect it's not something you really get in a lot of noir titles that's why it feels almost a bit alien to the noir sensibility at first that's why the people who see this film really love this film uh, it, it's it's one of the really hidden gems it's uh, you know it doesn't have the biggest budget in the world it was shot primarily mostly on location and it is Robert Parrish uh, as as a director for the first time so uh, you can tell that obviously it's not a big studio a feature but that also helps to give it some of that uh maybe a little bit of rebellious energy, but it, there, there's there's a sense of it being a, a smaller uh, ragtag outfit of uh, people trying to get the, the most out of their resources and trying to get some snarky energy in there and uh, make a little film that is so much better than really a lot of the A features of the time. So this this has unfortunately kind of fallen more into obscurity, but thankfully we have this newer UCLA restoration that really is is finally going to allow people to have better access and have a better quality presentation of this just wonderful noir gem that is so atypical of a lot of what you see in noir but the humor and the levity does not undercut the dramatic parts of the story there are quite a number of deaths there are some uh, really interesting outbursts of violence that are more impactful because you're not quite expecting them and when they do happen they are perfectly in keeping with the story and the mounting levels of danger and tension but they have so much more impact because we've had all this wonderful wit throughout the film that when the violence does come, it is quite brutal. And there's even a sequence that you really don't quite expect in a film of this era where Dick Powell finally boils over and it, his character actually goes and forces someone to play Russian roulette. So that's that's the type of stuff that you will get in uh, Cry Danger that is really striking for especially for the time period but even more striking because we've had all this wit and levity throughout that is so enjoyable that again when the violence does actually happen when the really uh, dramatic flourishes happen they have an even greater impact than they would have normally because uh, it, it's it's just really breaking through and and being even more uh, dramatically felt by the audience because we've had such a fun enjoyable time out, out, outside of that that, that again, when the drama really hits, it hits with a greater impact. Uh, this is impressively directed by Parrish for his for his first feature, uh, and I think a lot of what you see in this film also pops up in The Mob, which is also exceptionally strong and well made and well crafted and brilliantly effective for being again 
a smaller film that otherwise would typically just be another programmer at Columbia. So I think these films actually go together quite well, and you could uh, do a nice double bill of the first two films directed by Robert Parrish. So the, the, they are both exceptional, and I think they have a, a lot of uh, similar ideas and themes, whether conscious or not. Another element, in addition to the the wit of the script is that all the performances have a good energy and charge to them. The, the characters all, well, I mean, the characters are pretty quirky, actually. They all have a personality. They all have depth and dimension. Uh, even the villains, even the the various cops in the film, no one is that uh, that typical very run-of-the-mill, uh, cliched, stereotyped character. Every performance has an extra little bit of energy, an extra little bit of nuance, and I think really everyone in the cast is a standout. Even the small bit parts have have presence. Uh, in, in particular, it's fascinating to notice all of the female characters, especially going back to the the script always having this wonderful wit to it. Uh, it's, it's quite fascinating to see that basically every... <laughs> Almost every woman that uh, Dick Powell's character encounters in the film uh, sort of has a thing for him. <laughs> and so they're always uh, looking at him, uh, almost un undressing him with their eyes. And, and he sort of has to play every scene with a, 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 a sort of sardonic, oh, here we go again, and, uh, and a sort of bemused quality. And th this, this popping up. And every single one of these scenes, again, ties into the overall, uh, that, that spirit of levity and that, that sardonic quality that's in the entire film. Uh, it, it doesn't just pop up in, in snappy dialogue. It's infused into the film, uh, even down to the manager of the, the trailer park being a complete character and absolutely hysterical when he decides he has to play his ukulele all the time. <laughs> <laughs> in between people trying to shoot Dick Powell or uh, machine gun him to death. The film was shot by Joseph Birock and looks beautiful. Of course, uh, Birock would shoot many famous films and, of course, had been the primary cinematographer on It's a Wonderful Life. So uh, even though we are talking about a film that is a lower-budgeted film and has been passed around various studio libraries over the years and fallen into obscurity uh, and also mostly uh, shot on location. It is shot incredibly well and has all of the noir visual touchstones, but also gives you such a beautiful as is sense of Los Angeles at that point in time in the early 1950s and also giving you an idea of what different sections of, of the city was like. Uh, this is right there in the opening when uh, Dick Powell's character is uh, basically arriving back in L.A. after being released from prison. And Parrish, interestingly, uh, goes for pure atmosphere for, for the opening. And this very much sets the stage for uh, what we uh, then jump into for the story. So that, that opening sequence, uh, going for pure atmosphere, is what sets the stage for how all these characters interact. And Parrish also does this in The Mob, which has a similar uh, mostly wordless, entirely atmospheric opening. So it's it, you can, again, I think it's good to look at these films together. They have a lot of similarities right down to their openings, being very much cut from the same cloth. Ultimately, Cry Danger is one of the most enjoyable noir gems there is. It has such an energy and a wit that it almost... You might call it uh, having a slight breezy quality to it, and it's it's also extraordinarily intelligent. I mean, the, the, just the dialogue you you could just take by itself and look at the script and study the actual dialogue and the 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 beauty of of the lines. It's not just that they're funny; it's that they're funny witty and they sound like something somebody would actually say uh, that's 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 just about the most difficult thing to do in terms of trying to get uh, snappy dialogue you have to make it feel as if it's in the context of not just the story and the place and time but like it's actually something that could come out of these people's mouths it, it, it is uh, just effortless and then effortlessly delivered by the entire cast. So uh, this is, again, one of the noirs that I think is is going to be extremely rewarding over repeat viewings. And it's it's an absolute delight. If I had any real criticism, my, my only major point would be that the ending is very good and, of course, perfectly fitting, but 
it just seems a, a, a little underdeveloped because we don't quite see the final reaction of the the, the final villain or uh, the, the the character turn, uh, and it's much more staying on uh, Dick Powell's lead character. So it it makes sense why it's there, but uh, every time I see this film, I just wish that we got that final sort of moment where we saw what the other character did. You know, once once the uh, once the bottom drops out and uh, all the cards are laid on the table, you, you just you, you don't get the other side of it. So that that's really my only uh, sort of critical note with this film is that I wish we got that in the ending, but it is still a great ending that is perfectly fitting and really gives a you know, a, a, a gritty, darker uh, note to end on, which is also interesting because we've had so much levity and, and quirkiness and, and humor throughout. But Cry Danger is not the kind of film to just go with that and let the emphasis on reality and having still a gritty crime story that is completely noir uh, dissipate or get lost in the, the quirky characters and the humor and the, and the levity. So ending on a true noir note is uh, basically going full circle to how the ending is extremely atmospheric and very noir in its essence. So this is an incredibly well-made film. Uh, it's just an absolute gem. It's one of the noirs that I think anybody can see and anybody will have an absolute ball with this because it, it just has such an energy. It has such a heart, such humor, such levity, and an incredible sense of wit and energy that makes it absolutely irresistible and one of the funniest noirs you'll ever see. So in terms of the Blu-ray release, unfortunately, this is from Olive Films. So not only is the disc uh, out of print, but Olive has, has now actually gone out of business, sadly. However, uh, some people who worked at Olive are now at Kino Lorber, and Kino has been picking up a lot of Olive titles and either doing straight reissues or uh, making their own newer releases of uh, what was used previously as the master for the Olive release. So it's quite possible that uh, Cry Danger will see another Blu-ray release in the near future from Kino, maybe somebody else, but if anybody would do it, it's likely Kino since they've been picking up former Olive olive titles and also you can tell the shared sort of company history as this this release and most olive discs have the sort of bare bones menu that you see on uh, most early kino discs for example uh, but anyway this blu-ray is from a uh, film noir foundation funded ucla restoration of the film which was carried out in 2010 and the film literally opens with that ucla credit their classic black and white very simple text at the opening but uh, it is obviously far beyond anything we've seen for this film before and it's been kicked around a lot it was originally distributed by rko and has now wound up in the paramount library i believe because it got picked up and and turned into a, a holding by republic and i think this is somehow tied into dick powell being involved in the production and i think the film was sort of under his production company so uh, with a lot of films like this uh, that have moved around different studios and have been uh, shuffled into different uh, video licensing and different things. That means they usually fall by the wayside and they are very much in need of restoration work. Now, UCLA is all about doing archival restorations. So when you see a UCLA restoration, it's pretty much the best it can be, but they don't uh, go in and do the full-on intensive sort of, uh, or at least what we see now in the 4K realm with studios trying to make elements as pristine as possible. So you do need to keep in mind that this is an archival presentation of uh, the seemingly best surviving elements. So of course, that means you do need to expect all kinds of wear and, and print fluctuations, a little bit of movement here and there, the occasional mark or scratch or, or slight line. Or, or things like that. And all this is inherent in the elements they were working from. So that's perfectly understandable. This is merely a Blu-ray release 
of the UCLA uh, restoration, the same that you would experience if you went and saw this and uh, at, at an art house theater. Uh, you know, back in the day, UCLA restorations would usually be then printed back to film, and you might see an occasional UCLA restoration print in an art house. But now, usually, it's just a DCP of the UCLA restoration, complete with their their credit. So, if you've seen any of, of their work, you you know what to expect. That they're doing the the best that is humanly possible, but you do need to expect that the inherent wear and damage in the element will still be there. In terms of this particular restoration and master, the film is handled extremely well. It looks far better than I've ever seen. Seen it before, and the 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 wear and inherent damage is actually you know it's it's, it's quite minor. It, it it's never interfering with the actual visual experience. You will see some occasional fluctuation, a little bit of light movement, a, a mark or two here or there, but. Overall, it is quite clear. Uh, I think that the just about the biggest thing I noticed was, you know, some occasional fluctuation and some difference between the the uh, location photography and, in terms of the different areas of the city and different times of day or night. And then, of course, the actual studio set footage that is mixed in. So you're going to have some difference there, obviously. And then there were one or two sections that maybe looked as if they were having to mix a print element or the quality was just very slightly lesser enough to notice but again that that's intrinsic to the source and you're you're pretty much got to expect that in most films of this era i uh, did notice one tiny hair poking in but that may be part of the original source but it's, it's very very tiny basically this is an exceptionally good restoration of a of a relatively clean element so uh, there's no major damage that's very detrimental to the source and your viewing experience similarly the audio is in quite nice shape there are some occasional bits where you do hear the hiss being a bit more prominent, but that does seem inherent to the source. And I'm sure they were having to work from a print optical track, which is already going to be more limited in its quality. But the audio here does sound quite good. I don't really have a, a previous video release on hand to compare to, but there really hasn't been much for this film outside of some sporadic airings and uh, one or two releases far in the past of various elements. So this is the first time in anybody really tried to put work and effort into trying to make a better presentation of this film. So just like the picture, the audio is, uh, of course, going to show inherent limitations of the source, but uh, this is a UCLA restoration, so it's just about the best you can do for an archival preservation copy. So for the artwork, we have lovely original art done very simply and in the traditional style of your olive releases. So this is what you would expect from the now unfortunately out of print olive films. The rear has their traditional style with the write up and then the uh, sort of text block in the bottom is the traditional olive layout. And then the disc has a replication of part of the key art. Now, unfortunately, as this is an olive release, there are no supplements. Uh, olive really didn't go for extras. They were licensing rarer and more obscure titles and, and films that really did need a Blu-ray release. And again, some of the people at Kino were there back in the day. So Olive was sort of doing what Kino Lorber does now, but, you know, years and years ago. And unfortunately, the Olive releases usually were on the expensive side. That's why I never got too many of them. And then they only started getting into extras when they started doing their uh, deluxe releases much, uh, much closer to the actual closing of the company. So most Olive discs are, of course, just going to be feature only. And so uh, if Kino does do a reissue of this film, it's possible we might get the trailer or a commentary. That, those are usually what they what they go for. But um, this is still the best release of the film to date and from the modern UCLA restoration. So those are my thoughts on the Olive Blu-ray release of the noir gem Cry Danger from the UCLA restoration. I hate having to recommend out-of-print discs, but this is one where I absolutely have to. Unless Kino or someone announces they're going to do a, a reissue of this UCLA restoration, this is one of the must-own noir Blu-rays to track down. It's the best I've ever seen the film. It's from the newer UCLA restoration funded by the Film Noir Foundation. And this is just a gem. This is one of the most deliriously entertaining noirs you can possibly see. It's only 79 minutes, but don't let that fool you. There is so much to enjoy and just savor in this film. And there's so much wit and humor that you're probably not going to catch it all the first time. This is a, a, a film 
you're going to want to return to over and over again. Uh, it's an absolute delight, and it only gets better with rewatches because every single character is interesting and quirky and memorable, and the wit and the, the humor and the charm of this film is just incredible. Again, I hate recommending out-of-print discs, but uh, do yourself a favor and track down a copy of this Olive Blu-ray if you don't have this, because, again, this is just such an incredibly rewarding, fun, snappy film that has a crackling energy that uh, just uh, basically mandates repeat viewings because it's so much fun and this is really your best option to see the UCLA restoration from 2010. So as always, I hope my babblings on classic films, film noir, and physical media has been at least somewhat fun and informative. Uh, please do try and track down a copy of the Olive Disc. I know it's getting harder to find these out-of-print Olive titles, and they are really starting to shoot up there in price. So uh, if you keep an eye out, you can eventually find one of these. I did finally manage to uh, literally stumble across a copy of this this in one of my local stores so that's how I was finally able to get this release it had been on my my wish list for far too long and now there are all these olive titles that are in super out of print land because the company is no more so again it, the hope is that maybe Kino since they're the ones tied mostly to olive uh, the, hopefully Kino does do a reissue of this uh, but until then, this is really your only option to see the new restoration, and it's really one of the must-own Olive titles that unfortunately is now floating out there in out-of-print land. So as always, please do keep supporting both studio and boutique labels by buying films on disc to help keep both physical media and film culture alive. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. And if anybody else comes around, I'll add water to the soup. <laughs>